Thanks for joining us again on the Waterson's Danton video channel. And today I'm going to talk about um, buying your first HF transceiver. Now, if you've just uh, qualified, just got your license, or perhaps uh, you're about to uh, get your license, or even thinking about getting your license, you're probably also thinking about your first HF transceiver. And of course, it's a uh, it's a big purchase, it's an important purchase, and it's not a cheap purchase. Uh, I mean, you can work to a budget, but um, if you're spending money, then you really want to spend it wisely. So, let's talk about your first HF transceiver. One option, of course, is to buy a second hand unit because that quite clearly is going to be the uh, cheapest uh, way of uh, buying uh, uh, your radio. But there are some precautions that you need to um, take first of all. I would strongly advise you to avoid buying uh, an old valve transceiver because valves heat up and they cause an aging effect inside transceivers. So, uh, and because valves have been um, replaced by solid state uh, technology for so long now, it's almost certain the valve rigs will be quite old, so it might creak and so forth. And if you're not capable of doing your own repairs um, and you don't want to be off the air too too long, I would suggest avoid a valve transceiver. Go for a solid state transceiver. And you want to, of course, know how old the transceiver is. Um, and uh, if you're buying it uh, second hand, you can ask the uh, the seller how old it how old it is. Um, has he had uh, any has he had any previous previous owners? I would recommend that you also consider a transceiver with, with an internal antenna tuner because sooner or later you're probably going to need one to match your antennas. Now an internal ATU I've covered separately under antennas, but um, it's wise I think to consider a transceiver with an internal ATU. Um, another thing to consider is, um, does the, I mean, this is, this is going to be rather strange, but does the customer have the original box and the manual and packaging for it? Now, you, <laughs> you might question this. Well, I can tell you that in my many, many years of experience of buying second-hand equipment from customers, by far and away, the customer that has the box and the original manuals gives an indication that probably the radio has been fairly well looked after. It's not 100%, but it's a tick box. If the customer has got the box and the manuals, then he may well have looked after it fairly well. If he's thrown the box away and hasn't got the manuals, then, mm, well, you know, it doesn't quite uh, tick that box. Another important um, aspect is and you may you may not uh, think of this uh, um, immediately. Is the customer a smoker? Because believe me, <laughs> if you get a radio that has been contaminated with nicotine, that contamination, that smell, will last for ages and ages. You can't get rid of it. You can't just sort of spray it with something or sort of take the top off. <laughs> it doesn't work like that at all. Nicotine hangs around for a long, long time. So do check whether or not the owner has, uh, uh, is a smoker or not. So what else can we do? Um, what accessories does it come with? Does it come with the microphone? Well, it should do. Does it come with the original microphone? Uh, are there any other accessories? Uh, sometimes there's CW filters, FM filters and that sort of thing. Um, does, it, does it come with those? And uh, serial numbers. Another thing, see if you can get the serial number because if you go on the web these days and put in a serial number, it gives you some idea of how old the transceiver is. Now, there is another aspect of secondhand buying. You can buy from somebody that you may have met or you've, you know, you've replied to a small advert somewhere. Um, do remember that once you've bought that radio and something goes wrong with it, you probably won't get too much sympathy from the guy who sold it to you. There is a 
<laughs> there is a saying, um, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. And that really does apply if you're dealing with somebody that you only vaguely know or don't know at all. Far better, far, far better to go onto something like eBay or go to your local ham radio dealer. Now the advantage of going to the ham radio dealer is that you will get a warranty. You will get a, a warranty for three or six months. That dealer, if he's worth his salt, is not going to send you, sell you a radio that he knows to be faulty. He will have checked the radio before he even purchased it to make sure that it's okay, or if it's not okay, that it's repairable. And when he sells it to you, his reputation is on the line. So buying from the dealer means to say that you have got a warranty, and if something goes wrong, you're not left in the lurch. Also, of course, if you're buying it mail order, you have the right to return it uh, within eight or 10 days. So if you are buying secondhand, I would say to you, either go through eBay, go to a dealer. If you're not going in that direction, then for goodness sake, perhaps get in touch with your local club, um, club members. I mean, if a club member is selling your radio, it's probably going to be okay because he's going to have to face you week in, week out. So clubs are okay. But um, do be aware of the pitfalls. Smoking, is the box, does, has the guy got the boxes and so forth? It's, uh, and you, sometimes you get a feel for whether you should, you should or shouldn't, but you certainly will save some money. So if you're not going to buy secondhand, then obviously you buy new. So let's consider buying new transceivers because that does involve a bit more of an outlay. So let's look at uh, some of the uh, products that are available. The, uh, I suppose the, you know, the lowest cost uh, transceiver for HF is the FT450D. Been going for a long time. It does have an internal ATU, and um, it's you know it does the job. It's a hundred watt transceiver, and I, th I think you should actually think about a hundred watt transceiver because. Even though your license may not allow you to run 100 watts, ultimately you probably will want that power as you progress up uh, the, through the various licenses. And of course, if you decide to dispose of it, it's much easier to dispose of a uh, 100 watt transceiver. So yes, the FT450D I would put on your list. If you want to um, uh, have something that's really compact, then the FT891, that's uh, a HF transceiver as well. But it doesn't have an AT, built in ATU because it's quite small, it's about, about the size of a, uh, um, a small, uh, smallish or compact VHF mobile transceiver. It gets a lot, gets a lot into a very small space. Uh, the other favourite is the FT857 because that um, covers not only the uh, HF band, it also goes into the VHF and UHF region as well. So that's a, that's a good buy because uh, it enables you to cover the complete spectrum whether you're you know, just HF or whether you're HF and VHF. Um, the only thing is, it again, it doesn't have a built-in ATU, so you would have to have an external ATU if you needed it. Oh, I, I, I think that probably um, on balance, sooner or later you're going to have to um, purchase an ATU of some sort anyway. But it's a nicely compact transceiver. We then go up to something like the FTDX uh, 3000. Uh, which takes you into the thousand pound bracket and that for some of you that may be too much and I'm purposely trying to keep at the low end of the range because I, I just believe that most uh, uh, ham, new ham operators are going to look at the budget end of the market first because you don't want to spend too much money and then find you bought the wrong thing better to sort of dip your toes in the water um, Buy something that's popular. That's the other thing, buy something that's popular, it's got a name to it. Avoid at all costs at the early stages buying a brand name that you, or call it a brand name, buying a, a name of a transceiver you don't recognise. Uh, there are some cheap um, uh, transceivers coming over from China, quite interesting, but <laughs> I, would, I would avoid them um, in the early stages because you just want to make sure you, you, make a, you buy a mainline product that is easier to sell and that you've got some backup service for as well. We move on, I suppose, to ICOM. Now, <laughs> ICOM really have 
um, dominated the market in the last um, uh, couple of years with the IC7300 um, HF transceiver. The only downside of that is that it takes you just over the thousand pound um, sort of limit and they really haven't got anything now that's below that uh, that, that threshold. Um, wonderful transceiver. Uh, maybe you would you, you can get some some credit or something like that. Go go on to um, PayPal. PayPal gives some pretty good pre credit deals now. Um, great uh, transceiver. Probably the the the, the, the most popular age of transceiver. Uh, certainly in the last couple of years, and certainly for a long long time. Uh, it just goes on and on, very reliable, but as I say, it just takes you over that thousand, part, uh, th thousand pound threshold, which you may not want to go to. Another transceiver that you could look at is the Alinco SR9. Now, we sell a lot of that. It's a nice 100 watt transceiver. Uh, does what it says on the box. Uh, it's got a lot of capability, nice screen, and... Um, uh, it sells for around about six hundred pounds, so give that give that uh, uh, some thought. Uh, Kenwood, well, I'm not quite sure where Kenwood are going at the moment. Um, they've got nothing new coming along, and they seem to have lost their way a bit. Uh, so I think that uh, the the field really is uh, Yesu, um, Alinco, and Icom. If you can just afford to go into that. Uh, just over the thousand pound mark, and that Icom 7300 is a really nice transceiver. Um, so there we are. That's that's uh, that's my feelings on uh, um, starter rigs for the um, for for you if you're if you're just coming into the hobby. Um, <clears throat> I can only say from my own experience that uh, if you if you if your first rig is an expensive rig, there's, it's fine. If you've got the money, that's fine, no problem at all. Um, you just want to make sure that you buy the right rig. Um, and I think that if you're um, sort of, you know, if you're if you're a typical newly licensed ham, you probably want to sort of dip your toes in the water um, and uh, then see where you want to go from there. Because uh, the worst thing is <laughs> spending a lot of money and then finding that you bought the wrong thing. Um, Go to a dealer. I mean, uh, at Waterston Stanton, we do give a very good service. Uh, we've got um, license, lots of licensed operators down uh, in Portsmouth. Uh, they know their stuff. Um, a number of them have been been amateurs for quite a few years, so they they they, they know the hobby inside out. And it's their job to help you because <laughs> if they don't if they don't give you the help that uh, you, you expect and want, then we wouldn't survive. Um, we've been going now for 45 years, uh, 46 I think uh, this year, and um, we only kept going because by and large we gave the customers what they wanted, we gave them honest advice. And that's been how I've done my business over many, many years. So there we are. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much for watching this video, <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, enjoy your ham radio, and I hope we'll meet again very soon on our video channel.